Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here, and you're definitely in for a very special treat because I'm going to be reviewing one of my all time favorite stop motion animated feature that came out on February 6, 2009. You wouldn't believe it. What else but Coraline? Yeah, this is my Coraline doll that I got as a birthday gift. And she's wearing a yellow rain coat. <laughs> Some nice uh, pants and yeah, jeans, blue jeans, and <laughs> some yellow uh, shoes. Or boots. <laughs> yellow boots. Yeah, definitely looks totally realistic right here. <laughs> Even moves around, too. She has some lovely blue hair. Well cut. Even has uh, a hairpin too. And yes, <laughs> looks really cute. So yes, I do have the movie Coraline right there. This is exactly what the poster looks like. Well, the cover art actually. And I do have the poster right there, which I'm going to show you after. Yes, it does come with. Uh, a 3D version with 3D glasses inside. Uh, this is of course um, a standard Blu-ray release. It also comes with a DVD and digital copy. I got this uh, at Target for a very good price. and So I really love it, as you can see. Yeah, it was the best value, limited time, combo pack. So. Here it is, <laughs> which just says the best high diff movie experience. So same here. Yeah. Here are the 3D glasses. I haven't opened them. <laughs> uh, they're actually done by uh, Trio Sculpic uh, Limited Partnership. So they're used so that way you get to see them in Anagraph 3D. So they have that option. Um, has some nice features, of course. And there you go. It has a bonus disc inside. I also have another uh, DVD edition of the same um, collector's edition. But of course, uh, <laughs> I, it's, I put it in one of my other uh, cabinets. And I think it's okay because it's basically the same anyway. Just in DVD form. But it's nice to really have it too. I uh, just want to see if I can put it back inside safely. Come on. Yeah. And as you know, Coraline is based on the book by Neil Gaiman, who's best known for writing other stories, including Stardust. And as you may know, I, I do have the book right here that I also bought. <laughs> Looks nothing like uh, the stop motion animated feature from Leica Entertainment, but still, <laughs> this is exactly considered to be New York's uh, bestseller when this book came out in 2002. And yes, I read the book. I love the book. And it does contain some pictures. They're very similar. I'm going to see if I can show you what it looks like. Uh, yeah. This is Coraline right there. You know, just looking through all the, the rooms out there. And you can see a giant rat as a silhouette. Uh, I'm going to see some other ones here. Um, yeah. This is the other mutter. A button eyes. Okay, I know it's hard because I, I don't want to keep it off flat. Okay. It's one of the dogs here by the the two actresses. Um let's see if I can find it's just I'm just gonna show you a few. Um, see what it looks like. 
Yeah, there's the rats with the uh, key. And there you go. <laughs> Coraline and the other family. <laughs> Just tucking her in. Yeah, I'm sorry it's going to be... Yeah, I'm sorry. It, it is... Uh, it's hard to push it in, so... <laughs> yes, you can even see the the claw yeah, coming from the other motor. Uh, yeah, critics that crave this. So, great book. Read it all the way through. And... Actually, very closer to the book. Actually, the the only thing that's different though is that they didn't have the character YB. Why would you born? <laughs> of course. So I guess they decided to add that in there, and Neil actually accepted it too. So proud of him. And yes, uh, I do have another Coraline doll right here. Uh, yeah, it's open, of course. So let's try to see if I can. Get it out. Yeah. <laughs> He's giving that uh, <laughs> that whimper pose. I, I love that. Uh, I'm not going to get it out though. I just wanted to show you. But because I already took out the other Coraline Dell. But it's just traditional. Okay. I know I'm having a hard time putting it back inside. Uh, unfortunately, these are the only ones I have. Um, I was supposed to get a, a third one uh, that was... Uh, oh, Jesus, why is this so hard? I was supposed to get a third one that was supposed to be included, but unfortunately, uh, sad to say, uh, which is right here, there was supposed to be uh, the one where she was in her pajamas. But I didn't get it, so I only had just two. I know. What can you do? I mean, maybe I might. F I mean, who knows? I mean, maybe if I go to eBay or something, I'll, I'll find it. So. Uh, I also did got some Carl's Jr. toys uh, from the movie, including the tic tac toe. I have all of them, but half of them are in the boxes. So I can't get them out for now. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry I'm lazy, but whatever. But this is what it is. Um, there's all these uh, all these buttons as tic-tac-toes. You, know, like you get this as the X and this as the square. Yeah, blue and pink. Yeah. So... Uh, It's how you play the game. Gives you instructions. Oh, that's really cool. Okay. And of course, <laughs> see if you can put some eyes right here. Button eyes. Okay. Ah, oh, God, it's hard. Ah, damn it. You know what? Fuck this. I'm just gonna do it like this. I did it before, but then <laughs> I drop. I keep dropping it, so whatever. Okay. So, uh, hold on. Just gotta put all this other stuff away. There's the movie poster. Let's see if I can show you all the way. I gotta go all the way back because this is exactly why we have to deal with this. Yeah, this is the poster. I got this at uh, Movie World in Burbank, California. I was lucky to get this because I really wanted it so bad that maybe someday I might be able to frame this. So, uh, I know it's really hard, but it was really cool to have it. <laughs> so I love this poster. Okay, um, so yeah. <sighs> oh, 
is a big one today. I also have the, the movie soundtrack. has all the music that's included. That's all done by Bruno Akulas. I don't know if I said it right, but whatever. But he uh, composed uh, The Fiend and all the other songs included. And it gives it a nice flow to it. It gives it a dark atmosphere and all that to see what happens. And it is Hungarian, too. They had a lot of Hungarian... Uh, chorus right there but unfortunately again in my boxes like on these containers and stuff so I couldn't get it out it's in my closet so it's alright I, I can live with that but it was really nice I just never stopped getting tired of it I just love this film so much it became my favorite film of all time back in 2009 it was my number one no doubt about it, on the list of the best films of that year. And definitely the perfect time for the late 2000s and the decade alone to end. So with this one. Yeah, I know there are a lot of films that came out in 2009, but this one is my only top favorite I had to go for. For that list. I saw this three times in theaters. Yeah, twice in 3D. Because the movie is shot in 3D, as I already mentioned, and which is digital 3D, <laughs> not this kind of 3D. Uh, but there is a Blu-ray 3D available. Hopefully, it's still around, because I know they're going through a lot of changes here. But it's really nice. Uh, they did have a gift set, uh, very rare. It's a limited edition one. I, I wish I had picked it up. It had a lot of good stuff. You know, talking about the film and all the books and everything, yeah. And a whole lot more. It's just amazing. But to think, I mean, without this film, we would never have films like... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just putting my glasses here. We would never have films like Paranorman, The Box Trolls, and even Cubo and the Two Strings. And I know we're going to get the new movie coming up this year called Missing Link and that's coming out in April so I can't wait to see that but it's not going to be released by Focus Features you know, the original distributor for this film which is um, a subdivision of Universal Studios uh, it's going to be released by Inapurna Pictures so, yeah. um, but anyway yes uh, I saw it twice in theaters in 3D it looks so amazing eye-popping, visionary, stunning, that I never thought I would forget. And then I saw it in 2D at a local theater in Pasadena, and, and it still looks just as stunningly beautiful as ever, you know, with or without uh, the 3D. <laughs> so, because I love the stop-motion animation that they chose. I mean, they do use a mix of, of digital and CG effects to, to create those... Uh, images and all this other stuff to put into it but the rest is all practical all done painstakingly by hand they had to create for for months and I bet for a few years too and weeks you know trying to set everything right with all the frame rates all the movements of all the characters and and their body movements and all that everything I mean they were so hard all day, all night, just to get it right. So there you go. And I just love it. And I definitely thank Henry Selleck, the the animated director and and animated designer and all that, and also the writer, who gave us the Nightmare Before Christmas. And he has work on other stuff to actually bring this movie back to life from the adaptation of Neil Gaiman. Because it's a wonderful book and a wonderful adventure and a wonderful film that you'll never get tired of. Okay, so anyway, let's get to the review. Stars Dakota Fanning, yes, best known for films like Man on Fire remake with Denzel Washington, as well as uh, films like The War of the Worlds remake. Eh, don't care for it, the one with Tom Cruise. But she was also in the movie Charlotte's Web. Yeah, the remake from 2006. It's a very good one. 
Terry Hatcher from Desperate Housewives, but she was also in films like Tango and Cash with Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell. Awesome movie, by the way. We also got Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders. Um, for those who don't know, yes, they're both comedians who's, who's been doing shows like French and Saunders and all this other stuff. So I'm glad that they bought them in. Ian McShane, yes, great actor. John Hotman, uh, which also had uh, John Linnell to join in to do the, the singing voice of him. Yeah, because he's the member of They Might Be Giants. So I love how they throw that in. I love They Might Be Giants. Uh, Robert Bailey Jr. Keith David. Yes, the legendary Keith David. He does a lot of voice acting, such as Goliath and Gargoyles and other stuff that he does. Even the movie John Carpenter's The Faint. Caroline Crawford. Uh, George Selleck. Yes, I believe that's the, the son of Henry. Annika Neal, Hannah Kaiser, Marina Bobowski, and Henry Selleck, another son of Henry. <laughs> yep. Um, based on the book by Neil Gaiman, and it's written and directed by Henry Selleck. The movie begins... When Coraline Jones, voiced by Dakota Fanning, and her parents moved to Pontiac, Michigan, to their new home in Ashland, Oregon, because I've been to Oregon, of course, back in 1998. It's actually a place called Pink Palace Apartments, which that's where she meets her eccentric new neighbors, including Mr. Babinski, Miss Blink, and Miss Forcible. Yes, Ian McShane, yeah, and both uh, Jennifer Saunders and Don French. But due to her parents' constantly working, yeah, they had to work from the feet to the bone, you know, doing all this uh, paperwork and stuff, you know, through their laptops. Uh, Coraline suddenly frequently explores the entire area of the house, yeah, and like, including having to go to the restroom that has... Uh, all these creepy bugs around, uh, disgusting ones. And and then she actually explores all these other um, rooms around here and there. I have to write up a list to see how many that we have here. Because she's feeling completely bored. Well, that is until she spots a little tiny door. Which is a portal. As what leads to. But uh, she begs um, her mother to actually open it for her by taking out a key. <laughs> but it turned out that it had, a, it had tons of bricks, you know, all covered up. So that's exactly how it turned out to be. She can't even go inside or anything. So then um, when she got out, I mean, they they all started moving inside, and that's where she meets um, a kid uh, that's across the the other side, um, named YB, who's voiced by Robert Bailey Jr. There's also a black cat too, of course, would later be voiced by Keith David. Anyway, YB is the grandson of a landlady whose twin sister had mysteriously disappeared years ago. So YB suddenly gives Coraline a rag doll with button eyes that somehow resembles her. Yeah, because you know, she had blue hair uh, and she has a yellow raincoat and all that. So it's, it's just amazing. So anyway, that night, uh, a mouse guides through a door where all the bricks have been replaced by the courier to the other world. That's where you see all these ultraviolet uh, portal that go straight all the way in. And that's where it takes you directly to the other room that looks exactly the same, but not quite, because everything seems to be all perfectly nice. Everything's all decorated the way it should be. 
Because, you know, everything's all old and dusty, filled with cobwebs and everything. But it turns out that they're actually a double ganker with button eyes known as the other family. Yes, the other mother, the other father, and all the other people around. <laughs> as we're going to expect with, with the other neighbors and all that. And this is where she enters and says, You aren't my mother. My mother doesn't have what? B -b -b buttons oh, I'm your other mother, silly. <laughs> yeah, man, she's just going around cooking a lot of food. And I mean tons of food. For the other fodder. And he actually has those uh, animatronic hands inside the piano. And he does play the song where he just made it up. Yeah, about Coraline. Yeah, he does this, this song. And it was actually sung by the lead singer of They Might Be Giants. Yes. Uh, not other than John Linnell. <laughs> Making up with a song about Coraline. She's a cute, she's a piece, she's a not Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, of course, Coraline just drops right in. Just has some dinner with, uh, with both um, the other father and the other mother. And, you know, things were going so well. I mean, as far as everything's concerned, she went to uh, a circus, you know, where it had Mr. Bobowski and his training mice. Yeah, they had cotton candy, popcorn and stuff when they went inside the ring. Joins in with uh, the other YB. <laughs> also had button eyes, but doesn't speak. Yeah. She also goes to um, a stage play where you get to see two um, actresses, as we all know, Miss Brink and Miss Forcible. Yeah, one, yeah, one she's dressed up as a mermaid, the other one's dressed up as the birth of Venus, and yes, yeah, she's busty too. <laughs> but in the end, you know, they, they started doing their, their, their trapeze act, that once they rip off uh, their costume, so you get to see... Uh, you have two trapeze artists, and then you see all these dogs around as the audience. So, so of course, you know she sat around with uh, Ryby and you know, just a wonderful time. But of course, I mean, all of this she thought it was a dream because it might have been, or maybe it's, or maybe it might be real. But all this that could happen uh, mis mysteriously or miraculously. That it just can't be real. So, but of course, you know, she had to tell her real mother and her real father that about uh, what she explored, even though it was just a dream or what she thinks. <laughs> so most of the time, you know, just just you know, just trying to get ready. Um, the father had to uh, has a job, you know, just working on the catalog for all these. Uh, flowers and plants and all of, all that gardening stuff. Yeah, because he, he does work for gardening. Um, of course, um, the mother takes her to uh, a shop you know, just to get some school uniforms that she needs. She wants the gloves, too, because she found some some wonderful gloves that cost twenty four ninety nine, But she couldn't give it to her because, well, she didn't have enough. But, of course, she had to go to the store, and maybe she'll make it up for it, so who knows. So, things, so I know they're not getting along very well, as it seems. So, by the time um, she went back, she actually found out that, yes, it was real. So, things were going so well until something strange is about to happen when she actually uh, spotted the same cat as before, but yes, he speaks. Yes, Keith David. <laughs> but he actually tells them that all of this is part of a trap. So that means that, yes, the other mother is going to set her up and she's going to end up, uh, you know, giving her button eyes. So it's going to sew it up and she'll be one of them. But so she knew that she's in trouble. 
and this is where you know she decided to go all the way up to her room and you know, try to hide everything up and so that way hoping this this whole thing might be a dream or so but fortunately she's still there this is where she had to stand up to the other mother yeah just while she was eating some cocoa beetles yeah yeah well this is where she tells her that she wants to go home and this is where she says is that how you disobey your mother and she says you aren't my mother apologize at once no I'll give you a count of three one two Yeah, that's where she suddenly grows up and turns into an evil witch. Sort of like uh, a spider type, if you think about it. But yeah, she was incredibly evil. Not exactly who you think she is. And she was ready to take Coraline and put her inside a mirror that goes directly into the room that's trapped with three kids, which are all ghosts. Because we learned that she actually takes uh, their souls away. You know, it's I guess you could say it's sort of like Hansel and Gretel, even though it wasn't meant to be. Because, you know, she... Because the whole point of this is that, yes, the evil witch, you know, they always fatten the kids up with all this luscious food. <laughs> and all the gifts that she receives and everything. Until, well... You know how that's going to happen. She's going to end up eating them. But she actually eats their souls. So she actually does plan on that, but that's a whole different story. We never... So I figured... <laughs> okay, anyway. So in order to actually save uh, the kids' souls, she decided to play a game. And um, this is where, just by... Just with the help of the black cat, she decided to find a lot of clues that's been hidden somewhere, so that way she can take all the souls and give them back to them, so that way they'll be set free. Before that, I mean, she had to fight against all the others that's going to go around, and then once she grab, once she grabs all the uh, those clues that are inside those those balls. You know, the entire house and the entire world everywhere are just going to be, you know, all crum in crumbles. And it'll turn into just uh, a bright white light. Yeah. Of course, you can even see the moon that's, uh, yeah, the full moon is starting to uh, become into a, a, a button. And then, you know, the entire world, which includes that wonderful garden... That was created by the other fodder. Yeah, a beautiful garden that looks exactly like Coraline. And all this other stuff. And how beautiful the apartment is. And everything here and there. The circus. All of that. Everything. <laughs> I was just going to be in crumbles. And then this is where it becomes a battle. Because that's what happened when, when she was using the, um, the, the eye finder that was found by both Miss Spink and Miss Forcible. That was hidden inside the uh, the candy dish, and also the fact that since her parents were missing because they were inside the the snow globe, um, because you begin to notice that um, the car was there, uh, the phone was there, um, even the the food was there, but it's filled with bugs and everything. Well, she she's trying her best to actually uh, be able to go inside. Collect all the souls and have them set free, but then have to battle against the other mother. And that's how she changes and changes. And <laughs> she, you know, she even has a web too to actually uh, grab her. So th this was like a, a nightmarish experience for her until, well. It was up to her to actually uh, take the key 
as you open through the, the small door that leads to the portal. Just hit it somewhere so it won't be found. But of course this, the spider, sorry, the graver and and you know why he came to the rescue, you know, just dressed up and him with it with his bike and just ready to save her. And of course they dumped it into the whale so it will never be found. So there you go. By the end of the movie, that's where we finally get to see uh, YB's uh, grandmother. You know, they're already celebrating uh, a garden party. Yeah, already, you know, <laughs> yeah, the father is just, um, you know, putting all these uh, rose uh, buds and all these other flowers into the, into the flower beds. Yeah, and uh, yeah, even the, <laughs> the mother didn't like dirt. Yeah, they're just having some pizza with, with some cold drinks that Coraline is serving. Yeah, along with the rest of the neighbors, you know, Mr. Bobinski and all that. Yeah, so, yeah, things were going so well. In fact, it was, it became wonderful as for the new life of Coraline Jones and the rest of the family. So, they're all together. <laughs> Yep, no doubt about it, one of the best animated features of all time, especially in 2009, right up there with all the other films that came out, yeah, including Up from Pixar and all these other ones. Yeah, I've heard its budget's only $60 million. Yes, I could definitely see it all the way on screen in 3D and 2D form. It's just wonderful to look at. You know, all the flowers, uh, the apartments, uh, the look of it, the feel of it. But it is very creepy, very dark, very inventive and imaginative. And it's just, you just um, can't get enough of it. But you also love the characters too. I mean, the characters were definitely uh, well written, well done, definitely suits well for for them that man you just <laughs> you just never get tired of it I mean it feels like man I wish there were more <sighs> and I wish there were but we only have to have one standalone film based on a standalone book like you do want to see more adventures of Coraline um, going through the journey you know through the other world and that is the other world <laughs> yeah okay uh, but Dakota Fanning did a wonderful job doing the voice of her. I mean, definitely gives her a quirky personality to it, and that makes it work perfectly. I mean, granted, though, I wasn't a big fan of her at first, you know, after seeing one of her earlier works. But over the years, you know, she tend to grow on me as years follow. Because I mean, also the same year, uh, she even did the film Push, Surprised it came out at the same time as Coraline, and what well, do you know? I'm already seeing Coraline already, <laughs> but but it's of course Dakota Fan. <laughs> yeah, so she was getting better and better as the years follow, and I'm glad. I mean, she was definitely perfectly cast, even though she she, she started doing the voice since 2007, so it took a few years to to get there. Uh, but hey, it was cool that they get to do it over and over again to see how it works. Uh, Terry Hatcher, also wonderful. I mean, does give it a sexy voice, too, to fit in with the personality of, of both the mother and the other mother. And she's, of course, the evil witch and the villain of them all. But deep down of it, she's, she can be good, even though and she's a bit uh, also quirky, too. I guess she is like... Coraline at times. Um, yeah, the father, of course, is very sympathetic. That's voiced by uh, John Hodman. And did a good job, too. I mean, it's amazing that he got to play a different kind of role that he didn't expect it. I mean, he never did this before. So that's cool. Um, Don French and Jennifer Saunders. Hilarious. Definitely fun to see both of them together, but in an animated form, so it's like they're playing themselves in a way. I mean, if you haven't seen the 
French and Saunders, uh, the uh, the British. Uh, I mean, this British show that they had. I mean, it's worth it. Uh, Ian McShane, definitely amazing as the voice of Mr. Babinski. You know, he's very uh, flexible and athletic in a way. You know, he does all these stretching moves and stuff. And he moves around, but of course, he you know he does work with, with um, he works at the circus. Was training the uh, mice, and I love that. Yeah, and, and how creepy that all the uh, the mice turn out to be, you know, which turn out to be rats. Yeah, just once uh, the black cat uh, bitten it. I definitely love Keith David's voice acting in this film. Definitely amazing, perfect. He does sound like a cat, but he does get paid for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it's better than having to be in Tales from the Hood too. But then, then again, he was the best part of the film. Awful film, by the way. But you get the idea. <laughs> um, but he's always awesome, and especially as a boy actor. I love the look and feel of what the other world looks like. I mean, it just looks so beautiful with luscious colors around. Everything. It's all vivid, brighter. And the fact that it, it definitely looks exactly like Portland when they show the entire face when you go all the way up, man, something. Um, definitely well written by uh, Henry Selleck, and and I love his direction too. I mean, this was definitely the perfect job that he had to, to accomplish after reading the book. Henry Selleck did meet Neil Gaiman after he finished the novel. So they're actually going to plan on that. And also the fact that Gaiman was a huge fan of the number for Christmas. and So he invited him to make an actual adaptation. You know, through companies like Focus Features and Leica Entertainment. Which they just previously did The Corpse Bride. Yeah, by Tim Burton. Or Corpse Bride. He really touched a lot of things uh, to actually make it work uh, by mixing in all the the wonderful animation and the story set together. Um, even though it took a hard time trying to get everything right exactly, even if they had to add some new changes here and there. I mean, it must have been pretty hard to do so. I mean, with all the work with the entire Leica team, I mean, they, they put a lot of work and energy that, it, yes, it takes like seven seconds to to get some of the the body movements and, and the facial movements and all that within a week or so. And that was painful. I mean, they added the fog, they added all the, the, the details and all that. They even added a mix of of digital and CGI um, imagery on on some of the movements that they put in, but the rest, of course, practical, all well done. Um, it definitely looks so real, totally realistic. It almost looked like, you know, the whole film would have been shot live in live action form. See, and that's the beauty of stop motion because it's the way their movements are compared to um, hand drawn and CGI. And this is another reason why stop motion deserves more respect. And rightly so. I mean, they did it by hand. You know, they took a lot of work and energy to do so. And they were all staged, um, where they built all the entire mansions and all this other stuff. All inside in Harrisboro, Oregon. And, and they try to make it exactly like what Oregon looks like for that particular um, city. And the side of, of with the apartments and everything just looks realistic. So they had a lot of a lot of sets though, like over thousand or hundreds of sets that they built all by scratch and by hand. So they know exactly what they had to do to make it look exactly right. They also use a camera process to make the film in 3D, so they actually use uh, stereoscopy and try to uh, add all of that to make it from frame to frame from left and right to give it that uh, feel but of course when you had to see like um, two 3D versions or maybe three 
like Blu-ray 3D, which is supposed to be closer to digital 3D, as you see it feeders, or just your regular Anograph 3D that's done by Trioscopic Limited Partnership, which is green and and magenta mixed in. Also, in the movie, you know, YB actually started to you know, make fun of Coraline sometimes, and uh, there's even a scene where Coraline was ready to take a picture of him while he's just fooling around, you know, taking out a slug that's underneath the ground through the fog, and he just goes around saying, Zugzilla! Yeah, he puts one in his nose, his mouth, <laughs> everything, just fooling around. Well, Coraline's taking pictures. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm just uh, recording this uh, clip uh, for this angle. Just to give it a fun look of it. And I'm glad to see the film got nominated for an Oscar. Uh, along with the Golden Globes. And, and several other awards that we got. Like Andy, BAFA, Cinema Audio Society. Even American Film Institute. Everything. And, which I'm happy to see that it did one for best 10 movies. And any awards did one only free. Yeah, for best music, yeah, best character design, and best production design too. And several others too. So, but it sucks that it didn't win an Oscar. It didn't win a Golden Globe. And I wish it did. In fact, if you ask me, it should have been nominated for Best Picture, too. It should have won. Or at this rate, it should have won Best Animated Feature anyway. And may have the film up, won Best Picture, and get it over with. But instead, the Oscars just screw it up. That's a reason not to trust the Oscars. But that's what pisses me off. Um... But I'm glad to see that it made um, its opening out of number three at the box office, which that awful romantic comedy called He's Not That Into You was at number one. doesn't deserve that. It should be Coraline that deserved to be at number one. It would have made tons of money to compete. Because it would have competed against uh, Wallace and Gromit, The Curse of the Were Rabbit film. Because that film did gross uh, $60 million on its opening weekend, only made $192 million worldwide. Whereas this film only made uh, $124 million worldwide. So, didn't quite make it. But it still was a huge hit, nevertheless. You know, it, it doubled up its uh, budget of $16 million, so it really, it was really up there. And I love the 3D imagery that the film went for. I mean, everything was all eye-popping and soaring and everything. Gives it a, a creepy, dark fantasy feel to it. I mean, it's scary. Yes, I mean, it could scare uh, younger kids. For those who've seen it in, in theaters. And even on home video, too. So, I, I re recommend for that. But if you grow up, you'll definitely love it. I mean, no doubt about it. That, that's what I love about it. I mean, yes, it does have a bit of Tim Burton-ish into it. I mean, I would imagine Tim Burton working on this, and that would have been cool. But, nevertheless. Um, I just really love it, and I'm just happy that it got made, and got released, and got the attention it deserves, and hopefully it will be, even for its 10th anniversary. And I love everything that went for it, and again, love the music that they had, wonderful score. I, I just never get tired of this film, never. So, no doubt about it, highly recommend Coraline. And you will too, <laughs> right here. So anyway, I give Coraline, what else? Five stars. Yes, even she agrees with me. <laughs> I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Yeah, I know you will too. Maybe. Bye.